What is your name? Uh, Maya Adamska. Okay, and uh, Maya, are we alone in the universe? I don't know. I haven't been throughout the entire universe. Okay. In the question, are we alone, what does the word we mean to you? Animals. I think uh, animals. animals or uh, all life forms that evolved on Earth. So either all the life on Earth or animals, but not humans? Because some people say, we humans. Are we alone? Are we humans alone? No, I wouldn't narrow it down to humans. I think when I think we, I have at least animals in mind. At least animals and maybe bigger. And maybe bigger, yes, okay. and relatives. How about what does the word alone mean? Hmm. I guess in, given the context of your questions, I would guess the question is, are we, are life forms that, are life forms present only on Earth? Or are there other life forms outside of Earth. I'm asking this because some people who are not biologists think that even if we discover bacteria on Mars, we'll still be alone because we can't talk to it. We'd still feel, for example, if there's bacteria in this room and it's just you and the bacteria, you might feel alone. Oh, well, so my thoughts on being alone were actually going towards the bacteria. So when people like me sometimes ask questions, are we alone, we wonder if we can really think of a human being as the human being itself, or if we should be thinking of the entire microbiome, so all of the bacteria, fungi, and so on that live on us and within us, in which term we are never alone, right. really. So you know the answer. Are we alone? We're not alone. No, but I have doubts whether there is life outside of Earth. I see. Okay. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? I think in the context of life outside of Earth, I think it's interesting. And uh, I have always read a lot of science fiction, so uh, I have kind of entertained the ideas. But I am not sure if it's really very relevant to what we are doing on Earth and how, how we are carrying ourselves as people and how we are doing research. Well, I think it's very far if at all there is something else. Well, astrobiologists, uh, of whom I count myself, we, there's a little bit of a reasoning, follow this reasoning, they say, if we have evidence that something evolved independently several times on Earth, then that would be our best candidates for thinking that that would evolve elsewhere on other planets. We now know that there are lots and lots of other planets and many, many of them are going to be like Earth, we think. If that's the case, uh, we want to know, well, what would life do? And then the best candidates for those guesses are the things that have evolved independently. So, you're a sponge expert, right? That's what some people call me, yes. I consider myself a developmental biologist okay. working on sponges. <laughs> okay. Do you think there'll be sponges on other planets? Oh, I think that given that we don't know of any life forms on Earth that evolved independently of the one origin of life of which both we and plants and fungi are, uh, are derived, I doubt that there would be sponges on other planets. I would even be surprised if there were other DNA-based life forms on other planets. How about multicellular organisms? Or how about cellular organisms? Do you think there'll be cellular organisms? Is, I, is, some, is a cell such a universal feature of life that you'd expect it in any life form anywhere in the universe? Well, they, there are life forms on Earth that are not cells. There are viruses which are definitely alive, or at least which I would consider alive. So you could have a planet where you get origin of life and viruses, like an RNA world, but one that never evolves cellularity? I don't know. So I, I, I guess my first doubt is whether you can evolve RNA word again. We know it evolved on Earth. We know first cells from which we are derived evolved on Earth. I don't know if it is possible to evolve the same RNA or DNA based life forms or to evolve DNA. 
Well, how about forget about RNA and DNA. Let's just yeah. talk about a polymer that's self-replicating, like yes. in the, like the fundamental parts of yeah. the RNA world, not the specific mm -hmm. chemical parts. So the question is, would there be, would they then evolve into cells, and would the cells evolve multicellularity? I guess because compartmentalization is important, I would imagine that if Important. What, what do you mean by important? Because we're, we're looking for not important to life on Earth, but universal in the sense that you'd expect selection pressure to be universal to push in that direction. Yes, so I would expect, if there is life, I would expect that there would be selection pressure for, uh, for compartmentalization, which would be evolution of cells. Cells. And I guess once you have cells, you can evolve multicellularity all you want. I guess I would think that if very simple life could evolve somewhere, then it would be bound to evolve into complex life forms. I guess my biggest worry is the first steps of evolving polymers that can carry information. Now, I've talked to people who are experts in stromatolites, and they mm -hmm. tell, and these are largely bacterial thing, mats. Yeah that seem like whole ecologies to me. They have all kinds yes. of bacteria and they're doing this and they're doing that. It seems like a giant forest at a miniature level. And, but yet, I, when I talk to multicellular or zoologists, for example, they talk about the word complex multicellularity. And the stromatolite people talk about bacterial multicellularity in the sense that they have different shapes and it's not as complex, I guess, as the cellular differentiation that's in your body. Yeah. But still there is some differentiation and there's cooperation between these different species in a way that reminds you more of an ecology. So I guess, so what, what should we, ex when we say, sh here's the question, should we expect um, the evolution of multicellularity in these, you just said that there'd probably be cells, should we expect multicellularity elsewhere? And if so, is it worth making the distinction between complex eukaryotic multicellularity, like you and me and plants and fungi, or might it just say, hey, bacterial multicellularity is enough for me? I think the way evolution works, if you have simple multicellularity or if you have simple cells, I would expect you would only need time to produce complex multicellularity. So you think if we re went back to, let's say, four billion years ago, mm -hmm. on Earth, yeah. got on a time machine, yeah. go back on Earth, we get rid of everything that's happened, really, and just go back, re replay, rewind the tape, and then let it go forward again, you think that complex multicellularity would evolve again? Yes. Why? Because um, of the way that uh, life forms replicate. When they replicate, they make mistakes. Uh, and the mistakes provide a wonderful opportunity for things working better or worse. And, uh, and then we have selection. And if we have selection and diversity, then we are just bound to generate complexity. Would you say the same thing about eukaryotic cells evolving from prokaryotic cells? Yes, I, would, I guess I would. I would think once you have prokaryotic cells, the way eukaryotic cells evolved was by cooperation, uh, maybe somehow not always peaceful cooperation of uh, different prokaryotic cells. And I think this is one of those things that just has to happen. If you have different prokaryotic cells, one of them at some point will decide to uh, eat one another. Of course, when I but, say decide, I don't really but mean there seems conscious to be a, thought. But there seems to be a big gap between the complexity of eukaryotic cell and the relatively simpler prokaryotic cells, and we don't see prokaryotic cells before our very eyes on the way to becoming eukaryotic cells, do we? We, we should expect to see that if it's something that you think is likely. I don't think so. I think because the kind of missing, we, we would all like to see the missing links, right? Mm -hmm. When we see different species, we, we want to see what was what is between them. Uh -huh. But the way evolution works or the way, the way selection works is that those transient life forms are not very stable. They either evolve and change or they disappear. So, so we, don't, we don't see continuity 
in the life forms that we see. We do not see a lot of animals looking like between species animals, unless they are chimeras. We don't see animals that are transient between different phyla. We don't see plant species that are kind of very similar. So I wouldn't also expect to see life forms that are somehow between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But you think that that transition would occur over and over and over again if we replayed the tape of life? Yes, that's of course a guess and an opinion. Well, but what, what is that opinion or guess based on? I guess on the way evolution works, as I said, on the, on the diversity that is generated by mutations in the case of the life forms we know, and on the fact that those mutations produce different fitness, and because they produce different fitness, they would be selected for or against. Now, multicellular eukaryotes all have mitochondria, or most yes. of them do. Now, wouldn't we expect to look around and ask a microbiologist and say, hey, here's a prokaryote that has endosymbiotically incorporated an amoeba, a prokaryotic amoeba-like thing that has incorporated a alpha proteobacteria, and it looks like it's going to become a mitochondria. Why wouldn't we see the same thing happening again and again so often that we'd see those different stages? I'm not sure if we are looking close enough. I also think the time scales are huge. Um, we also know that the environment is now full of very fit organisms. So a lot of niches are occupied. It's very difficult to make this transition and be immediately fitter than everybody around. So you're giving the Darwin reason when he was asked, why don't we see the origin of life? He would say, well, that's because it's already ex in existence. Exactly. I, I guess I didn't know Darwin said that, but yes, yeah. because, because the earth is full in a way. Yeah. So, but your question was, what would happen if we came back and wiped out, yes, yes. say, eukaryotic yes. life forms? So there's two different situations yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. I see. So I guess that's, is that the reason why we also don't see life originating, do you think, on Earth? Yes, I think that's one of the reasons. Another one is, would we recognize life originating on Earth? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you could always talk to the computer experts and they would tell you that there is a lot of life originating. Uh, computer egg viruses. Com right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we see it, right? Now, now Simon Conway Morris and others yep. have argued that if some feature evolves multiple times independently, then that becomes a good candidate. Now, do you agree with that logic? Do you think that's a reasonable way to approach guesses about extraterrestrial life? I'm still struggling with the idea of extraterrestrial life because I think there was this one lucky accident that resulted in the life that we have on How Earth. How do you know it was lucky? Maybe it was oh. a cosmic imperative like Christian de Duve, a Nobel Prize winner in biochemistry mm. said. You don't like that, you're wincing. Uh, I'm wincing. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think that's outside of science. <laughs> you do? Oh, so the origin of life is outside of science? No, no, I think the idea of invoking, I, I would call it a lucky accident. I think anybody who invokes anything that is well, wait, an wait, wait, imperative wait, wait. is outside of science. But also, but all you're doing is saying there's a probability, he's saying it's probability of one, and you're saying it's really low. Why is his opinion worse than your opinion? Oh, I, I was just worried about the term cosmic imperative. Or well, that would mean yeah. probability, probability close to one. Yeah. Yeah. And you said lucky accident, and that implies probability close mm -hmm. to zero. So what makes your view more scientific than his? Well, I guess, yeah, I guess you are right. That we, we don't know what the probability was. That is, right. that is, that is correct. Yeah. But you kind of tend to think it's kind of lowish. Yes. Why? I don't think I have really strong scientific argument for that. Maybe because if I thought it was high, I would expect to see life on other planets, and we haven't seen it. We've just started to look. Yes, that is true. <laughs> um, I guess that that would be one of the... If, if I looked around and I saw life on all the planets around, I would say, well, clearly any planet can evolve life, but because I haven't, I'm we, not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying it's not everywhere for me to see. Right. It's not everywhere for you to see. And, but you just gave a very good argument about why you shouldn't expect it re-evolving on Earth. Yeah. 
Um, but, but Simon Conway Morris invokes things like eyeballs, okay? Like, you have eyeballs, I have eyeballs. Now, I guess plants and fungi don't have eyeballs. But octopus has. Octopus have eyeballs. Some jellyfish have. So do you think eyeballs or, let's say, visual perception is something that you would expect in life elsewhere? Yes. I think if, if we assume that life could evolve somewhere else, then I guess I would expect it to evolve complex uh, body plan and I would expect it to be able to use different cues from the environment. Vision well, would be probably likely. Well, let's go a little bit more basic than that. Mm -hmm. How about a head? Having a head. Now, heads, I think, are confined to animals. Yes, and, and not you, all of them. Right. So would you expect uh, heads... Aliens to have heads? I don't think necessarily, no. I mean, if you look at an octopus... They've got a head. Mm, only, right? <laughs> 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 head and legs, yes. <laughs> but they don't have the same body plan as, uh, as we do. Jellyfish don't have heads. Mm -hmm. Comb jellies don't have heads. Sponges, for that matter, do not have heads. Okay, so let's, put, let's, put a, let's go back, I don't know, 700, 800 million years, and I've got some sponges on the Earth. Yeah. So I don't have years. heads. Mm -hmm. Do you think heads would re-evolve? I don't know. I mm -hmm. think the honest answer is I don't know. Give me some speculation. Mm -hmm. What would what make? Uh, there must be two sides yeah. to this. Yeah. What are the two sides in your head? So, <laughs> so I guess uh, you could argue that heads would evolve because if you evolve. Uh, if you evolve movement that would be on the substrate, then, so if you, if you stop being, so sponges are filter feeders, they sit on the substrate, they draw the water through them and expel it. Their larvae, however, uh, swim with a clear direction. They have radial symmetry. Do their larvae have neurons? No, they don't have neurons, but they have sensory cells. Sensory cells. They, they have... They Light sensitive? Yes. Potentially also chemosensitive. And some so, other cells. But they must process that and to convert. If there's light over there, I'm going to swim towards it or away from it. So the, the larvae of some sponges have a pigmented ring on the posterior part yeah. of their body. The pigment cells, which are photosensory, are connected with cells that have long cilia. Oh. And there is no coordination, but the reaction to light changes the position of the cilium, oh. which changes the direction of the way that the larva is swimming. Is that the same for coral larvae? The coral larvae also have some photosensory uh, abilities, at least some of them, but I, they do not do it the same way as Sponge larvae. I've, I've heard that some, I think coral larvae have a little bit of a brain and then when they go, they swim somewhere, then they set and then they digest their own brain because they don't need it anymore because they're not moving. Is that, uh, no? No. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely don't have a brain. Uh, they definitely have neurons and uh, adult polyps definitely have neurons because they need the neurons to react to physical stimuli. But, but, but sponge larvae do not need... Sponge larvae and sponge adults do not have neurons. Now there are two... So why do corals need them and sponges don't? Uh, corals are much more sophisticated than sponges. So corals are much more closely related to us yeah. humans. Uh, they have the nervous system and they have the ability to react to physical stimuli using the nervous system. But the sponge larvae react to physical stimuli without, without using, going through yes. this intermediate step yes. of processing. Yes, exactly. Oh. Now, we have a lot of arguments in the field of sponge biology. Uh, one of them is whether sponges never had neurons. So they have evolved and remained neuronless. Uh -huh. And then neurons evolved after sponges separated yeah. from yeah. our uh, tree of life. And another one is that sponges did have neurons and they have lost them because they don't need them being filter feeders. Well, are there any examples of colonial eukaryotes that have cells that differentiate a little bit so that they act more or less like a coordinating signaling pathway? 
so that the thing has a very, very basic neural system? Well, I guess that would be the Nidarians, so corals, hydras. No, but how about uh, coanocytes that are not, not sponges, but they are colonial? So they're, you mean coanoflagellates? So yes, they are yes, protists, yes. but they are not multicellular. But some of them come into uh, form colonies, though, right? Yes, but they form colonies. So they form colonies by division of cells. So they are uniform, genetically uniform. Oh, they're monoclonal. Yes, they are monoclonal. Oh. Uh, there are several beautiful paper, fr beautiful papers from Nicole King's lab in Berkeley showing that the coanoflagellate colonies form clonally. Uh, but they definitely do not have neurons. But do they have any type of, how do they coordinate their... They do not coordinate. You mean they just have are uncoordinated flagella flapping around and making them go in all directions? That's how it looks to me, to be honest. Oh, I, I don't believe yeah. that. Well... <laughs> <laughs> I'll have you to ask should, Nicole. You should ask Nicole. <laughs> okay. uh, they mainly spend their time being uh, colonies on substrate and they just beat their flagella, whether there is any coordination between them or not. I have no idea. And the flagella is to, meant to make water circulate through? Yes. Kind yes. of like a proto-sponge? Yes. So we sponge people believe that the coanocytes, so cells of sponges that have also collars and flagella that are beating, are very similar uh, and probably homologous to coanoflagellates. Okay, so let's go to another planet far, far away. Mm -hmm. We have life, we have water, and we have some si simple cells. Do you think coanoflagellates would evolve? Hmm. Well, it's a beautiful system. You know, you have a collar. Well, isn't every species beautiful yes. in its own way? But, you know, we'll, <laughs> some of us like some species I, more I, than I, others, I, right? I know that, but I'm trying to be un, unprejudiced <laughs> yes. here. Oh, I am not unprejudiced. I, I know you are, but I'm, let, let's try to get you in a more yeah. objective frame of mind. So, there is... Is there any reason to believe that a unicellular organism well, I guess eukaryotes. Let's let's back up. Let's go yeah. even further. Yeah. Eukaryotes. Yeah. Would you expect eukaryotes to evolve elsewhere? Well, I guess if you have prokaryotes evolving somewhere. So if we there are two different kinds of men, of of a mental experiment, right? We can think of as you said, if we go back to Earth, to the time that there were prokaryotes but not eukaryotes and we remove all eukaryotes, would we expect eukaryotes to evolve again? That's the and question. to this, I say, quite likely. Uh, Not everybody agrees with you. Oh, oh, I don't expect everybody to agree so with So why me. do you think quite likely? Because it's extremely useful to be eukaryotic. Isn't it extremely useful to be anything that exists today because they've proven that they're yes. useful? Yes, so that's how I know that they are, that it's very useful because eukaryotes... But English is useful. We're using English, but yeah. nobody expects English to be spoken elsewhere. No, which is why I say once you have those prokaryotes that we know from Earth, it is likely to evolve eukaryotes. But I'm not saying, I have never said, and I still doubt, that you could simply evolve prokaryotes independently. So my... I guess my, my point is once we have DNA, RNA and proteins evolving, what we have now is possible. Well, we know it's possible, but it's also likely. But another one is... Wait, wait, wait. Let me stop yeah. you there. You said evolving what we have now. You and I are here. We're yes. speaking English. You yeah. don't mean that humans and English-speaking humans or, or Polish-speaking humans would evolve again, do you? No, but I would expect that... Uh, animals that communicate in complex language would evolve again. Animals. Okay, so let's go to... So you think that on every planet that has had life on it in the universe, there are fungi, plants, and animals? No. I said that if we went back to Earth and yes. wiped everything out right. after prokaryotes evolved, yes. I would expect large photosynthesizing organisms... Plants. Plants, large photosynthesizing organisms, right? And uh, large uh, plant eating organisms. Fungi and animals. And yeah, and other large organisms that eat the other organisms, okay. animals, to evolve. So, in some generic sense, you expect yeah. fungi, plants, yes. and animals on other planets? Once, but only if the planets were seeded with the same beginning 
life forms. Okay, that's that means that goes takes me back to your yeah. wincing at at uh, to do. You said yeah. so. You think that that if there's an unlikely step, it's the first one. Yes, yes. I think I see the the unlikely step in the first one. This is perhaps because I simply don't understand it. So as an developmental biologist, as an evolutionary biologist, and when I think of myself as evolutionary biologist, I, I start thinking about the time that, uh, that there were already eukaryotic cells. Uh -huh. I believe I understand how each next complexity stage could have evolved from the previous complexity stage, yes. which means because I understand it, or I think I understand it, I, I see it as but, likely. But uh, let's say I'm a linguist and mm -hmm. I study English and then Germanic languages and then I study Indo-European languages and I study how these things transitioned and mm -hmm. became English. Just because I can see how mm -hmm. it happened seems to me to have almost zero relevance to its probability of happening again because it's a historical science, mm -hmm. very historically contingent. At least that's what Simon, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Simon sorry, Stephen Jay Gould mm -hmm. would argue, I think. So do you disagree with that? Oh, I think I, when you talk about languages, I think about it as species. I never say that if we went back to single cell prokaryotes that we would get tigers and okay. monarch butterflies. So not the same species, but something similar as a functional way yes. because of the selection pressure? Yes, exactly. Oh. So I'm not even saying we would have humans. I don't even know if mammals would be okay. the dominant group, but I would expect complex animals to evolve. Okay, so you think there's a a niche for yes. complex animals. Yes, I think there's a niche for complex okay. animals. Okay, next question, a little bit more complicated. Do you think there's a human-like intelligence niche that you would expect to be filled elsewhere? I am not sure about that. So Why we, not? You're so sure about these other niches. Yeah, well, I, when I say, <laughs> I mean, sure is... Uh, um, we know there are complex animal life forms on Earth that can change their environment, like ants and bees and termites, but we don't expect, we don't see in them the intelligence we recognize. So I think there is a niche as the environment is getting, as the biodiversity is increasing, is increasing there is a niche for organisms to change their environment, to become dominant in a way. I am not sure if intelligence in the terms of sitting around and discussing origin of life is something that is in any way, if there is a niche for that, or if this is just an accident. So Carl Sagan thought that it was a niche. Yes. He thinks it's universally adaptive to be smart like we are, but other people have said, no, 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 that's not, that's crazy because they've pointed to the idea that human-like intelligence has only evolved once, so it's a species-specific characteristic, and you just said you don't expect specific species to re-evolve. Yeah. I guess when you are asking me those questions and I say, I think this is likely, I think this is unlikely, I really, I'm using my scientific experience, mm -hmm. but I'm really talking about my feelings and opinions, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, I think I, I strongly stand by, by, by the statement I made that that there is a niche for large photosynthetic land creatures and for creatures that eat them and for eat creatures that eat those creatures that eat those. I am not sure if there is, it's definitely useful to be highly intelligent, but should I say that it's likely, possible? I wouldn't say it's impossible. So I definitely wouldn't say, oh, this is impossible. Human intelligence could have evolved so, on so Mars. So let's go back. 20 million years before there were apes yeah. and we're going we're gonna to run this experiment called the earth yeah we're going to run it a million times mm -hmm. what fraction of that million times would you expect uh telescopes and computers and human-like intelligence to evolve hmm. i think in quite a number of cases i think one percent ten percent a hundred percent Point one percent, point oh 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 one percent. I don't know. I wouldn't say hundred, and I wouldn't say zero. That's out of a million, right? Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know, one in ten, one in a hundred. One in ten. And what you're, where are you pulling these numbers out of? Just out of a hat. I, it's, I'm just trying to be as far as possible from impossible so or you, so you're trying absolutely. To, but aren't you trying to yes. weigh in your head selection pressure? How universal is selection pressure for human-like intelligence? Is that what you're weighing in your yes, head? Yes, I guess so, yes. How... How... How really useful or how, how fitness increasing is the intelligence that we have. Now, but that contradicts what you said about five minutes ago when you said you do not expect the same species to evolve. No. And we're talking about a human-like yes. intelligence, therefore that is a species yes. specific. So, so we're talking about humans. Yeah, well, but is human-like intelligence species specific, I guess, is the question. Of course, of you course it is. You asked about telescopes. That's, that's, you didn't that's ask. That's one yet. species. Yes. One no, species, human-like human intelligence, like. one species, human-like, <laughs> one species, so that's yeah. a species. Yeah. So a lot of people think of intelligence as something generic, and they talk mm. about human-like intelligence as if it were generic, but what they're really talking about is one species. That's why I'm kind of getting, mm. hoping that you will trip over this. Uh, yeah, well, no, I don't... Or clarify. Yeah, so I don't think humans had to evolve from even after there were apes, although I think very smart apes were bound to evolve really? and sit around the fire and discuss origin of life. So let's talk about South America then. Here we have a whole continent full of millions of species, for some of our New World monkeys, and they had, and our brain increased in size by a factor of three mm -hmm. in three million years. Mm -hmm. They have about a hundred million years of independent evolution, no apes, mm -hmm. and they didn't seem to have any recognizable evolution towards this direction that you are saying is likely. Oh, but three million years is a very short time, right? Three mi that's right. Yes. So since so we did it in three yeah. million years, they have a hundred million years to work with, and they didn't. Yes, but and I guess because I know that, I am saying that it's not extremely likely, but it's also not impossible. Why couldn't it be impossible? Because you would say English evolving again would be impossible, wouldn't you? English is so quirky yes. that yes. that's impossible. So why isn't human-like intelligence as quirky as a specific human language like English or Polish? Because most people agree with that. They say, yeah. English is so quirky, forget yeah. it. We don't expect it elsewhere. Human-like intelligence, oh, we expect it everywhere. Oh, I and I keep, yeah. oh, wait a minute, what makes you think yeah. that a species, like a sulfur-crested cockatoo, yeah. you wouldn't go looking for a sulfur-crested cockatoo on another planet, right? No, and I'm also not going to look for a human on another planet. You're not, a human-like intelligence. But I guess the, the, the question is the definition of what do we mean by human-like intelligence? Do we... We mean the ability to make a telescope and a computer yeah. and to speak a language. Then that, I don't think it necessarily has to be done by humans. But on Earth it has. It In, was. On Earth it has. Which I guess tells me that it's it unique. was un, or unlikely. Or unique. Or unique. It <laughs> might be. Yes, exactly. I would rather be on the unlikely edge, then... Why? Because uh, I'm at the unique and you're yeah. unlikely, so let's talk about that difference. Why? I guess unique is a very strong statement. I mm -hmm. think saying that something is unique or saying that something is impossible are extremely strong statements and there is well, so unlikely, much we don't know. But unlikely is also a strong statement because there you're saying the adaptive niche that mm -hmm. this particular species and only it on earth there's a range into which other life forms would evolve that seems like a also a very strong statement as well but it's not as strong as saying absolutely sure or absolutely impossible I think unlikely is something that we deal with. You know, we are You're unlikely, unlikely to get a Nobel Prize. Unlikely <laughs> includes unique, yeah. right? So it's a larger set. <laughs> well, no, I would say it's very unlikely I'll, get, I'll ever get a Nobel Prize, but uh -huh. saying that I'm going to get a Nobel Prize is equally silly, uh, yeah. then I will absolutely never get it, right? So unlikely is somewhere in the... Okay. Unlikely. Yeah, unlikely. Yeah. So you think... how So... There are people who are spending millions of dollars right now looking with radio telescopes for radio signals created artificially by human-like intelligences mm -hmm. on, that have evolved elsewhere. So do you think that it's unlikely that they'll find anything? 
They're looking at millions yeah. and millions of stars. I think, I would say it's unlikely. That does not mean I don't think they shouldn't be doing that. I think it's one of those things that are worth doing with having the feeling that it's unlikely that it's going to actually be successful. But unlikely means, let's just say, small epsilon, small number. Yes. They multiply that times a large number and you get something. Yes, but then we have limited time, right? So I would say they should keep doing what they are doing and maybe we'll get lucky. Well, this brings us to a question called Fermi's Paradox. Have you heard of Fermi's Paradox? I don't remember. Fermi's Paradox is, he, this is about 50 years ago, Fermi was thinking, yeah. you know what, if, if he, he shared your opinion that, well, maybe, you know, once you get life, you get human-like mm -hmm. intelligence. And then you build spaceships. And then what do you do? You travel around the galaxy, exploring cal uh, other planets. And if you do the calculation, the galaxy is this big, mm -hmm. you can go from one end to the other at a reasonable speed in about a million years. And this could have happened 10 billion years ago. So you could have gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth many, many times and colonized the galaxy. So his question was, where are they? They should be here already. If human-like intelligence and technological civilizations were common, or, at some, or not necessarily common, but just had a non-zero probability. So we don't see them, so we need an explanation of why we don't see them. So do you have a favorite solution to this paradox? Because you seem to share oh, human-like intelligence, it's maybe, but mm, unlikely, but still it's possible. And then I multiply that possible by a very, very large number of stars of like a hundred billion, and probably is close to that number of Earth-like planets, and then one of them will become, you know, technological, and then poop in a million years, or two or ten, doesn't matter, they would colonize the entire galaxy. Because you biologists tell us that once a life form evolves, it goes, it spreads out as much as it can and it occupies as many niches as it can. And technological civilization, one would argue at least one of them, would take over the colonize the galaxy. So what's your solution to this paradox? Well, I think that the, that the first thing I, I should say is that I am still not convinced that these carbon-based life forms were uh -huh. The origin of life is yeah, your bottleneck. Yeah, yeah, so for me the origin of life is, is the major battle, bottleneck. Another one is that, well, we've been here for a very short time, really. So I am not sure if we would have not missed uh, the others coming to have a look Well, bacteria have colonized the Earth, and we certainly haven't missed them. We missed yeah. them until about 100 years ago, right? <laughs> but, but now we know they're yeah. there. Well, they haven't been missing <laughs> us. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> they, right. They've that's been right. with us throughout the time. Okay, we just so, haven't. So that's another possibility. Maybe we just... Maybe they're there, but we don't know. Yeah. How about the bottleneck of human-like intelligence? Yeah, as I said, I guess for me, the bottleneck of origin of carbon-based life form and DNA-based life form and so on is much more difficult to kind of, it's much more of a narrow bottleneck than mm -hmm. the bottleneck of evolving human-like intelligence. Uh, and why is later. that? Why do you put that? I, it's a, I guess, personal, uh, personal opinion, not a, uh, why is that? Um, I guess because I, I know the history of life on Earth and I'm biased by the fact that I know that once a life on Earth started existing, then it led to human-like intelligence. So I, I have seen at least one experiment which started from uh, prokaryotes and ended up so with human-like intelligence. So once you have this tool called Darwinism, you can yeah. do yes, a lot, exactly, a lot but, yeah. but the evolution of Darwin, Darwinism yes. or Darwinian selection and evolution is not that easy. Yes, that's, that's I guess, how I'm... Okay, let's, saying what's likely and what's less or more likely. Let's, let's talk to your emotional side here for mm -hmm. a second. I'm going to ask you, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Oh, I'm not even sure if I would like to find any aliens. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had to meet aliens, what kind would you like meeting? Uh, what kind would you prefer to meet? Because we might detect life in yeah. our lifetime, right? And if let's just say, what, emotionally, what kind would you like to detect? Well, I guess I would like to detect aliens that, uh, if I were to detect aliens, uh, that 
are compassionate and generous and kind. Like we are to the bacteria on Earth? Yeah, which I guess would say I wouldn't want to meet aliens that are like us. Which <laughs> <laughs> Most people say the opposite. They want to meet people who are like us. Yeah, but I mean, if they were like us, they would probably start a war, take over, mm -hmm. eradicate us. Okay. So I am, I think because I think there is a possibility of uh, human-like intelligence evolving, I am not one sitting with excitement and hoping that they will come because I am not sure if I would really want to meet them, okay. especially if they were technologically much more advanced. Or maybe they, if they, they will were, be. They will be. Yeah. <laughs> if they if they come. So let's say that you're on a committee, and yeah. the committee is trying to decide: should we send signals out to outer space, telling people, telling outer space about our existence, or should we just listen? Some people think we should not even listen because if we listen, we'll get a message that'll try to take over our brains like a meme, and then it'll make mm -hmm. us kill ourselves or something. Stephen Hawking said, yes. we should keep our head low, so we should keep it down like yeah, this, yeah, not yeah, send out yeah. signals. I've, 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 I have thought about it. As I said, I, I have uh, read, science fiction. read science fiction when I was younger. Um, Stanislav Lem, probably. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, That even when I was not so, much, so young. So, I think the argument would be that if we are to be detected, then we should be detected as intelligent beings rather than just crust on Earth. So perhaps if, if we expect that the aliens are so sophisticated that they can find us, I guess they can find us whether we send signals or not. And then maybe it would be good if they knew that we have some thoughts to share. So you should say we should play the intelligence card and let them know that we're smarter than anything else, therefore maybe they will spare us. Oh, that maybe they'll like us. Like us? <laughs> okay. okay. Now, this question about uh, are we alone, what do you think are the public's or students' biggest misconceptions about this question? I don't know. Um, I guess I'm saying it a lot because I, I just... You're allowed not to know. You're a I scientist. Just, yeah. We're allowed not to know. You're I not a priest. Know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think... The general public views are shaped by a lot of science fiction, which is not a bad thing, because uh, that's where we humans put our thoughts on how we would like or how we are afraid the aliens would be or would not be. I don't even know if it matters much. Well, it definitely matters for the funding. Uh, for looking for other life forms. But to be quite honest, I mean, I, I think it's a worthwhile pursuit to try to figure out if there are other life forms outside of Earth. But there is so much, so many life forms we still haven't described on Earth that I would probably be focused in my own backyard. <laughs> okay, so let's say I give you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat, you have to spend this money to help answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? A hundred billion dollars have to answer, help answer the question, are we alone? I think I would start by uh, gathering the experts <laughs> and yeah, asking for gathering, <laughs> Have a meeting. Yeah, have a, yes, definitely, a workshop. <laughs> well, we have meetings yeah, all the time yeah. and of experts yeah. and there's lots of opinions. What's your opinion on how it should be spent? You're a biologist, so you probably would say 95% of it should be spent on biological research. And yes, of course. Uh, on finding out how life evolved and uh, originated on Earth. I guess, quite honestly, that would be what I would say. Should because I admit to that? that's the biggest that? bottleneck. That's the biggest unknown in your mind. Because that is the biggest, yes. That, because that is the part that I really uh, don't understand. Now, I don't know how much of the fact that I don't understand it is because... I've been focused my entire scientific life on understanding how animals develop and how animals evolved. So the starting point for all of my thinking and research is really eukaryotes already present. Um, so I well, you called yourself a developmental 
biologist. Yes. But aren't you really a developmental zoologist? Yes, you could, you could think that, although I am very excited about development of plants and fungi as well. So I'm very interested in the communalities between, uh, between developmental features of non-animals. So, in fact, the reason why I'm talking a lot about the fact that uh, once you have eukaryotes, you are bound to produce multicellular organisms or complex multicellular organisms is because I know of how many common features development of different multicellular organisms has, even if their last common ancestor was unicellular. Well, let me ask you a similar question. Forget eukaryotes for a second. Let's just talk about bacteria. Now, I most of us used to think that bacteria started as unicellular organisms. Kind of like eukaryotes started unicellular and yeah. then became multicellular. But it's not obvious that bacteria were ever unicellular. They might have been uh, uh, multicellular from the very beginning because that's what we see is stromatolites. That's a multicellular community. We don't see necessarily singles cell things. Maybe it's a selection effect associated with not being able to see them in the fossil record, but it might it? be that life started out yeah. multicellular. Yes, so I think the, the, the problem here is, here is definition of multicellularity. So stromatolites are composed of multiple cells that are cooperating, but I would not call them multicellular because they are not operating as a single organism. A single organism. So but you just told me that I wasn't a single organism. Yes, that and is And you true. called me multicellular. Yes. So I call you multicellular. So why, plus, do, why do I get to be multicellular and they yes. don't? <laughs> because the physical uh, presentation that I see of you is a body of a mammal that is multicellular. And I know you are covered and filled with a lot of single cell organisms as well. But this, if you look at your hand, the cells are the cells in your hand are all derived from the single cell, the fertilized egg. But if everything is mutually dependent, kind of like an ecosystem, then why make this distinction between an organism and an ecosystem? That is a very, the distinction is really important because wow. the unit of selection is different. So aren't the units of selection kind of like a big unknown in biology? And you yes, have genes we, and we cells. argue, yes, we argue, but we, I think most of us, especially people with zoology background like me, consider that the unit of selection is, we would say until recently that it is the animal, the, the clonal or, organism. Or Dawkins would say the gene. Yeah. Other people would say gene cassettes. Yeah. Other people would say a single cell. Yeah, Other I, people would say I tribes. Would, and yeah. I think the, the way we understand it best is if we, uh, if we are focused on the unit of selection as the organism, although we now start to understand that the associated microbiome is extremely important. But you can strip yourself from the microbes and then replace these microbes with other microbes and you will be fine. But you can't strip yourself of your DNA and be yourself. So I think the it's kind of the uh, if you look at the stromatolite, you can replace the parts, you can... Well, if I were a gene, I could say the same thing about getting rid of the body and then yeah, just put the that, gene in a different place, yeah, that's, right? Yeah, that's the Dawkins kind of talking. That's well, what's wrong with my... <laughs> no, what, I'm arguing for yes, multi-level selection, yeah. no yes, single the, yes, unit. Yes, and if that's is, the case, yeah. then the argument about an ecology being no. a organ... Or, or no, no, but a unit agreeing selection. that there, is, there are multiple levels of selection, that is not the same as agreeing that an organism that that a group collaborating group of single cell organisms is the same as a clonal organism well not the same but as far as biology and evolution are concerned we're not i don't care whether they're the same or not i don't care whether that type of organizational structure will evolve elsewhere and particularly whether i'm trying to unbreak this icon in my head of Life had to start as single cells and then it became cooperative. Yeah, no, no, no. Life had to start as... Life was never starting as a single... There was never a single cell or for a long time. Or even a group of yeah. single cells that might yeah. have started as and a they have, more integrated. Yes, 
but they were not, but it didn't start as a complex multicellularity with cells that were clonal and had different function. So it definitely didn't start with bacteria living by themselves because it's okay, impossible. Another, another yeah. question, origin of meiosis and sex. What can you tell us about that? Would, if, should we expect sex on other planets among life? Is meiosis something that we should expect to re-evolve and therefore sex? I don't know if meiosis, but definitely sex. Do sponges have sex? Of course, all the time. Two sexes, male <laughs> and female? <laughs> they uh, depend on the sponge species. So there are species where you have very simple determination of two sexes. You have male sponges and female sponges. And you have sponges which are hermaphroditic. You have sponges that change. That are both male and female? Yes, at the, yes, either at the same time or at different times. And you have sponges in which we simply don't know. Really? But they definitely have males. Can't you look at their DNA and say, are you a male or a female sponge? Uh, in not all species you are able to tell. And um, any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists of any kind in which they will be exploring some of these questions? Uh, I would suggest starting with studying earth biology and take it from there. But I would expect that most students who start studying earth biology would be so excited about the questions <laughs> in earth biology, they <laughs> stay Would have little time to go outside the earth. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we astronomers are pushing in that direction. Yes. So last time again, are, are we alone in the universe? I don't know. And why don't you know? Because I'm a scientist and I don't know everything and I'm not afraid to admit to that. <laughs>